Thanks for coming. I'll, I'll keep you entertained with some discussion of some music technology and some music that's been made with it. Um, and welcome again to Seabase. By the way, if you haven't been on the tour, I really recommend going on the tour. You should go on the tour. It's, uh, it's really something else. Um, I'm Edgar Berdahl. I'm an assistant professor at Louisiana State University. Um, but I did my uh, postdoctoral studies here at the TU Berlin, and I had some master's students there. And so um, I'll be presenting this right now, and then they'll be presenting a few things later kind of related to it, and it all sort of ties together um, around the topic of open source haptics for music. And really, I would just say that I've been inspired by all the open source work that you all have been doing. And so this is part of my and our efforts to try to contribute back um, what we're able to while we're doing research in music, of course. So, so the title is Open Source Haptics for Music, and it's basically separated into two sections. Can you hear me okay? Maybe it's very compressed. I guess that's okay. Um, uh, the first part is called Haptics and Force Feedback, and the second part is called Physical Modeling. And so I tried to organize things as separately as possible as I, as I could. Um, and uh, along the way, they'll, they'll talk a little bit about some music compositions. Um, using these technologies. And um, some of the things that these technologies enable, and this will be revisited with each music composition, but uh, some, some ways of creating timbres that sound uncannily familiar but are nonetheless new, which is exciting if you're composing music, um, generating high fidelity and highly immersive sound, so sound for many channels. I'll show an example of a physical model I used to create a piece for 62 loudspeakers. Um, new touch controllers for enabling fundamentally new interactions. Um, algorithmic ways of generating music, uh, enabling more accurate performance of musical gestures using haptics to provide uh, touch cues. Designing instruments that are fundamentally possible, um, but without electronics would be very inconvenient to build. That's something else that this, this um, technology enables. And enabling even the performance of musical gestures that would otherwise be maybe impossible or certainly very difficult, such as very fast drum rolls. Um, and so I'll just sort of revisit those here and there throughout the, the presentation. And by the way, please feel free to stop me or interrupt if you have a question about something technical, because I didn't plan to go into a lot of technical detail, but if anyone is very interested in something, I can always talk, talk more about it. Um, so, so the first section is on haptics and force feedback. Why, why do we even care, actually, in the, the audio community? That's a good question. I guess we've known for quite a while that we can create any perceivable sound using digital sound synthesis or at least that, that certainly can be argued, and it has been argued since um, the 60s, if not earlier. But I think there's a good question of how to control sounds, um, because there's so many of these possible sounds, but how do we, how do we use them to, to create music? Um, and so I, I like to draw this diagram of a person interacting with a musical instrument, because this is the way we usually think about it, that. Uh, there is a performer who's providing a mechanical excitation to a musical instrument, which could be a computer, um, and receiving auditory feedback. And that's sort of, the, I guess, maybe the minimum of what you need. Uh, but it's also really useful if, if you're interacting with an instrument or an interface to have some sort of visual feedback. So it's nice to you look at the keys on a piano before you put your hands down on the piano. Um, that's, that's a really useful aspect. But I think the, the haptic or the feedback having to do with a sense of touch is something that's missing in a lot of uh, user interfaces. And it's, it's been there in, in um, traditional acoustic instruments. You feel the vibrations of the sound, which enables you to control it more precisely and intimately. Um, and you feel that with very low latency, which also helps you control a musical sound in live performance very 
Precisely. There are other benefits to haptic feedback also, which I think we sometimes forget about. But you know, one of them is that we have so many different receptors, haptic receptors, all over our body. We can, you know, we may want to look at the piano keys before we put our hands on the piano keys, but um, we can also feel where the keys are, and that can help us find them if we're looking at a score. So we don't always want to use the visual channel while we're performing. We might want to look at an audience instead, for example, or another musical score or a conductor. Um, and also, actually, one other benefit of haptic feedback or f feedback having to do with the sense of touch when interacting with interfaces is um, the fact that the, the human reaction time is, um, can be faster for haptics feedback than for any of the other um, feedback channels, which is to say that you can produce, you can respond faster to a haptic stimulus than you can to a visual or auditory stimulus if you're just sitting there waiting for it. So psychologists make tests like that. Um, so, and of course the brain is also important, so I kind of like to also draw the brain and show where the feedback loop is. Um, because there are more feedback loops inside the brain and the human body, and actually the human motor control system is distributed to some extent, so you even use neurons throughout the body a little bit. I didn't put them in here, but it's kind of fun to talk about them, I guess. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to show this slide just to motivate why this is interesting. Um, I mean, that we can respond to. So it has to do with the hu human biology. That, that's part of it, yeah, because we have these neurons distributed through the body that can have their parameters adjusted by the brain. So a response can go up just part of the arm, maybe to the spinal column, and then return before going all the way up to the brain. So that's one reason that I know of. Um, other questions? Yes? I, I would imagine so, but I don't know I'm not enough of a neuroscientist. I'm not a neuroscientist at all, really. I'm just interested in some of these things. Yes? Okay. So if I put this on, then I can carry the microphone around. Yes, I understand. Yes. Great, thank you, yes. Um, all right, so there are lots of um, devices out there that have haptic response of all sorts of different kinds. Um, there are game controllers that have motors in them that provide vibrational responses. There are mice or joysticks. Uh, phones, just about all phones, have vibrotactile feedback in them. Um, I listed the Moog guitar here, maybe that's a bit of a stretch, but it has audio feedback into the strings. Um, that's a hard disk that's been repurposed to provide haptic feedback. The Wiimote has vibra vibrational feedback. Uh, then there are robotic arms that sense the position of an end effector in real time and provide uh, feedback uh, very precisely. Um, and some of these are open and some of these aren't. And but there are nice people out there who helped open them. So thank you for that. Um, and if, if you're interested in this stuff, you might want to look at this Git repo. It has some, that's sort of where I, I keep the sum of everything that I can. Um, it's not the easiest place to find things in because there's so many various things in it. The other ones will be more clear. But anyway, if you're looking for a driver for some of these things, you might find it in there. Uh, for instance, with the, the Novin Falcon, which is a game controller, 
which has the three degrees of freedom, um, uh, that was hacked by a colleague of mine in Berkeley, which eventually caused the um, designer also to release a driver for it, which they otherwise wouldn't have released. And so now there are, there are drivers for this, and so we use this uh, device after, after getting access to it through the source, we used it. It's, um, is the microphone going in and out, or is that just me hearing that? It's only the loudspeaker. I'm just wondering if this is getting streaming out on the internet sounding weird. Um, anyway, so uh, using this, uh, I wrote a piece called When the Robots Get Loose. And this was um, because I wanted to experiment with the idea of being able to have uh, a human user being able to remotely control some robots playing percussion instruments. And a lot of the musical robotics that's going on these days is in one, one axis because it's a lot easier. But with this uh, system, it was easier to do things in three dimensions. And so that's, that's what we experimented with here. And um, later, I'll be sort of coming back to physical modeling more. But the way this, this work was organized, this, this piece was written, was that um, basically the computer simulated virtual springs in between the, uh, does the, mouse work? the, the first, it had a virtual spring between this one and whichever one of these was enabled. And then live, the performer records loops, basically, where the loop, instead of, in music, we, we have a lot of loop-based music, but in this piece, we instead record the trajectory of the motion of the gesture instead of um, the sound and use that to reproduce it. Because it sounds interesting if you speed up or slow down the recorded gestures when they're played into these musical instruments. So. If, this one is a tambourine, that one is a snare drum, and that one is a shaker. And there's another shaker one that you can't see. Um, but let me, let's see. Let me try to play that here. And Jack and Alsa are fighting a little bit. So, or maybe it's pulse audio. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I should have removed Pulse Audio from this machine. I don't recall if I did or not. Um, anyway, let's see. Uh, four. So I'm just going to play some excerpts from it. So it starts out kind of simply like that, as you can imagine, and by the end it builds up more. Um, I think you get the idea, basically, that you can, when you speed up the gestures, you get this kind of interesting sound of someone playing an instrument really fast that's very hard to do uh, or impossible to do uh, otherwise. So. Yes. Ah. Uh, 
that um, oh, I have to repeat the question again. Um, so um, per, per um, um, instrument per gesture, um, how many samples do you need? Because I would believe that the, um, the excitation, you con control the, the um, excitation of, of the, um, of, of the, the, the velocity of, of, of the instrument somehow, and then you need to like um, have a different um, velocities. Um, you have to have the different samples. Um, uh, which were recorded like like a um, um, tambourine hit slightly to a tambourine hit um, hit hard, um, yeah. That was the the only. Or do you somehow do you take one sample and just just um, tune the, the the volume according to the velocity? Um, well, I, I admit that when I wrote this piece, I was thinking more about the shakers mainly, so that I would create a pattern or a loop for one of the shakers and get it to play that single loop. And so actually, I only recorded one loop for each of the instruments. And that's, part of, that's why the piece starts out simply, because the performer has to record each of the loops live as the piece is starting. And then at, as the piece progresses, you play the loops back faster or more slowly or with a different spring stiffness inside the virtual model um, to transform the sound. And each of those samples is a three-channel wave file because it has the X, Y, and Z position uh, of the instrument. The velocity, is always the velocity of the, um, this, each sample is always the same mute. Right. Oh, I guess, I, guess, I guess that's what I got wrong. Right, okay, you're not recording um, yeah, the audio, but then only the, the gestures. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Um, there, yeah, there would be lots of different ways to do that, but that was an exploration of a way to use uh, the, t the, the driver for the Falcon. Um, and then, uh, the next step was to make a device which was easier to reconfigure. So the Falcon was, it was not easy to take the Falcon apart and put it inside other projects. So even though this, the, the source was opened for it, it, it wasn't possible to make any, anything out of it. And so we decided to go back to first principles and try to create a completely open source hardware uh, force feedback haptic device to use in these projects. Um, and so that was the fire fader project, and you can see a picture of it right there. Those are two faders from a mixing console that have motors attached to them, and that's this device here. And the workshop tomorrow at, I think it's 10 a.m., will be using these. So if you want to try one out, you can try one uh, tomorrow morning. Other uh, devices that are supported in, the, in this GitHub repo include uh, Bilver Plank's device called the Plank, which is a repurposed hard disk drive. So if you're very hardcore, like Bill Verplank or his, his colleagues in Copenhagen, you can uh, take a hard drive and cut it open very carefully to expose the DC motor, which is a nice motor, uh, and add a position sensor to it and use this to d build a device that has a very low friction and low mass, which is a nice device. Um, and so that's also supported if you're interested. Um, but we've been using the faders because they're the least expensive. And uh, so it's easy to incorporate them into lots of things. And also because they're hard to break is one reason uh, we, we use them in a lot of things. So here's, here's a device that has eight of them inside of it that are oriented kind of like a mixing console with force feedback for music. Uh, this one is called the haptic hand, and you can use four of them vertically. So Dennis Huber will be telling about this this afternoon. Uh, this one is an embedded instrument with a Raspberry Pi inside and a MIDI keyboard that are use, used uh, to control the sound along with two force feedback faders. And then this is a student project which also has one of the faders inside of it that was uh, one of these um, uh, early prosthetic arm devices that was low cost and open source. So 
that's the benefit of having an open design is that it's easy to be incorporated into lots of things. And I go around um, letting you take them for a test drive at uh, conferences. And there are various, in various labs, people have rebuilt the device also because we tried to make it um, an easy, easy device to reproduce. So I'll tell you about a piece that I wrote for uh, the, these faders. This is called transmogrified strings and the idea was to start out the piece with some traditional pluck string sound. So you pluck a string and you can feel it and then you can interact with it in various ways and then as the piece progresses uh, the strings become more and more strange and so the sounds kind of, the timbre of the sounds kind of resembles a string but it starts to transform more and more until it becomes very different. So, let me play an excerpt of that. Oh, full screen. So that, that at the end there is what a string sound would sound like if you could tune it to half of a hertz. Actually, there were four of those. Uh, it would be a very strange string because it would actually feel more like friction when you're interacting with it because you have to wait so long for the wave to come back and hit you again. So that's why that you could see that the force feedback interaction with it is quite strange. And the sounds that you get are very interesting. You get these transients, right, when you're touching it and releasing it. Before that, you're hearing sounds of the strings as their pitch was being automated rapidly. Uh, there was a point before this where I was using sawtooth waves to vary the pitch of the strings, but at that point, it was more randomly adjusted, so band-limited random noise for adjusting the length of a string, which you could, you could build in real life, but it would be very difficult. So, yes. <laughs> what was the haptic fi feedback here? It, you were feeling the strings uh, vibrating? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, and that's the score. So here's, here's the virtual model of, uh, that was calculating the sound and the force feedback. So if you have a very long string that just goes off as long as you need and you have a slide that's moving back and forth, controlled by a computer program, then you could use a plectrum to sort of pluck it right here. And you're just hearing this half of the string. You're not hearing this part of the string on the other side of the slide that's changing its length. But anyway, that's where the, that's the physics controlling that, that model. Um, so you'll have to try it to, to maybe to agree with this, but I, I think it, this the haptics in this case enable the performance of more accurate musical gestures because as you're moving the slider you can actually feel the strings so like there's a point where there's a zither with 20 strings that you're playing and it's mu it's much easier to accurately try those strings um 
if you can feel them. So I, I'll, I'll give you a chance to try that out later. Um, I thought the timbres that it created were interesting because they sounded kind of like strings, but not entirely. I was surprised at how much like explosions they sounded, actually. I didn't anticipate that. I guess that's why we call it experimental music. Um, one thing you can do with this technology is design instruments that are fundamentally possible without electronics but would be very inconvenient to build. You could, of course, build eight of these and have these slides moving back and forth, although I think you would have a very hard time making a slide move back and forth a thousand times a second, as were, it was evident in some of the examples. Um, and maybe you could, it's maybe a bit of a stretch, but maybe you could say that you're algorithmically generating music at the end when the sounds of the strings become, when the pitches become so low that the strings are rhythmic. Um, so that, that was one example of something you can make for the fire fader. Um, so I thought I would tell you a little bit about the open source hardware in case you're interested in making your own. Um, so if you get an Arduino and plug it into a motor controller like this, so this is the Gravitex two-motor nano motor controller. The nice thing about that one is it fits into a breadboard. So you can literally plug one of these into a breadboard and then hook things up on the breadboard however you want and make something interesting. Uh, and the Arduino fits nicely on top of it. In Europe, it might be a little bit easier to use the Arduino flavored motor controller, which there is one that the Arduino Leonardo plugs into. So you could alternatively get an Arduino Leonardo and plug it into that. Um, but in either case, you, the, the, the schematic is the same. It's quite easy to hook up because each of the faders uh, is just uses a potentiometer to set the position. So you connect one wire of the potentiometer to ground, you hook one to uh, the analog reference voltage, and then the other one goes to an analog input. And it also has a capacitive sensing feature, which turned out to be very useful. These, that's what, one other nice thing about these faders, is they have an internally, there's a wire that goes to the knob. And so you can hook that up to a digital pin along with a one mega ohm resistor. And then the uh, firmware knows whether you're touching it or not, which is also, also useful. Um, and with this, you can get the firmware from the GitHub repo and uh, you can modify it if you wanted to change something about it, or you can just use it as it is. Um, and it takes care of everything and sends the data out over a USB serial connection to the computer. And this is, uh, this is the feedback loop of what that's actually doing. So here's the, here's the Arduino. And uh, so it senses the position of the fader. It, it's an analog voltage which it measures, and then it converts that to a digital stream that it sends over the USB serial into your laptop. And then that goes into whatever software you're using, which uses a floating point computations to calculate the sound and the force feedback signal, which goes back over the USB serial connection through the, the Arduino to the motor controller, which then becomes a force uh, on the motor using the pulse width modulation uh, output of the motor driver. Um, so it's easily adaptable to a lot of different cases. And uh, we provided, and so in, inside the repo, if you want to use it, if you want to use it inside PD, there's, a, there's an object I made in PD that lets you access it, which just uses PD's COM port object to access the serial connection. Um, you can use it within Max if you want, uh, because there's also one for Max. Um, or there's one uh, which uh, uses QT, a QT generated application you can use. I guess I won't go into that detail, but um, basically this is what the, the QT based um, driver does. I might come back to that later. Um, so did anyone have uh, questions about the fire fader?
So what's the sampling frequency of the slider position? Is uh, it like 50 hertz enough or? No, it has to be faster than that. Faster. Um, to reduce the lag, I guess. Or? Yeah, it's about one kilohertz. Okay, and for the motors as, as well, I guess. It's the same, yeah, so this, um, this diagram here shows the timing, um, which is, it's, the timing is initiated by the software in the computer. So the, what the software sends, whenever the uh, application in the computer sends a new force over the, the USB, whenever that's received, it immediately sends it to the motor, and then it samples the analog to digital converter and immediately sends it back over the serial. And that turned out to be an easy way to synchronize uh, the driver, so that because you don't want it sending and receiving, or I found it troublesome if it was sending and receiving at two different rates. And so by doing it that way, I kept them relatively synchronized. And Arduino was strong enough to do this, I think. Was. Um, I won't say that it's perfect, but uh, I put a low-pass filter in the firmware, okay. which, that, is the, that was actually more of the issue, that the analog input pins are not super accurate. But if you have a digital low-pass filter, you can compensate for that to some extent. Okay. Cool, thanks. Um, but if, if, if you're interested, bring, and if you have a motor with a position sensor, uh, bring it tomorrow, and we can, we can try to hook it up. Uh, Uh, not so much a question as uh, are you aware with the Arduino you can change the resolution of the analog input and you can then actually get a faster response time off it and uh, you get less jitter, less jitter because you're using a lower resolution. I did change, yeah, the firmware does change the timer that adjusts the maximum sampling rate and so that's one of the reasons why the the low pass filter works better because it receives data at a high rate to use um, and so that that is how I address that issue um, and, and if you're curious uh, come try it yourself and you can see what you think about how it feels um, so another piece that uh, was written for Firefader was for the Laptop Orchestra of Louisiana, a piece called Throw, which is a network piece for eight performers. Each performer has a Firefader, and this was the first piece for more than two performers where you throw, where uh, the performers interact with the same objects, because basically when you throw an object off the screen, it lands, uh, depending on the settings, it lands on someone else's um, fader. And so that was part of the concept of the composition, um, that when you throw something away, it actually goes somewhere else, <laughs> which is easy to forget, uh, I guess, in our Western society. Um, I apologize for showing a Max patch at this conference. Um, this piece is written in Max. I should have written it in PD, um, but I didn't. Edgar, there's a question from IRC that uh, I've only just picked up on now. So uh, Robin Garius asked, uh, what is the round trip latency for the fire fader? A few milliseconds. All right, thank you. It, it also depends what software it's communicating with on the computer, but um, yeah, that's, that's what it usually is. More or less than 10 milliseconds? Definitely less than 10. Yes. Yeah, 10 would not feel very good. Um, I only measured it once with a scope, uh, but I actually measured the analog signals to check for sure using max, and I was getting about three milliseconds at that time. Um, and you can't get much lower than that anyway with a normal operating system, um, much less over a, an easy to use uh, serial interface like USB. Um, here I plotted the way the sound synthesis works in the piece, um, but maybe I should show the video first. It will be more clear, I think.
So you may have noticed I was cheating a little bit by changing gravity. Uh, I guess I, some, so the, the most rigorous way of composing music for physical modeling, you might say you're not allowed to break the rules of physics, but sometimes I do. Um, so I guess you notice you heard a sound every time one of the masses was sitting on, one of the, on top of one of the devices. Actually, I guess you couldn't see that, the, but each person, when, it's probably not too unobvious. When you move the fader, when the performers move the faders, the faders on the screen move up and down. And this shows just how that works, basically. If you imagine the blue line is the position of the device, and the, um, the dotted black line is showing a person throwing a mass up and down, you, the difference between those curves is proportional to the force. And so that curve is used then to, to as an amplitude envelope for synthesizing the sound. And so that's where the sound came from in that piece. So it's an interesting way of thinking about physical modeling where you combine a physical model and some more traditional sound synthesis to make um, musical sound. That was set by a score. So that was predetermined. Those were predetermined. Um, that was a good question. Yeah, so the, the frequencies were not algorithmically generated, but in some sense the rhythmic pattern was to some extent algorithmically generated, and it really depends a lot on the mood of the performers, what happens with the masses and where they end up. End up. So it, it, it turned out a bit different than I had imagined because I thought it was going to be the same or similar every time, but they really do something different every time. Um, so it's kind of interesting because it's an instrument that's sort of fundamentally different, or certainly different than traditional acoustic instruments. It would be, you could build it without electronics, but it would be hard or very inconvenient. Um, so that was sort of the part of the discussion on haptics and force feedback. And then I thought I would talk about physical modeling, which is a way of programming force feedback using physics, but you already saw that I was doing a lot of physics, and this is sort of the physics framework that we'll be presenting tomorrow at 10 o'clock if you want to install it on your computer and take it for a spin. Um, so, and this is using Faust, so thank you very much, Faust developers, for creating uh, the Faust compiler and tool chain and philosophy and uh, amazing system. Uh, so if you have a Faust DSP file, you can compile it into all these different targets. And I'm sure I'm missing a lot of targets that are on there. And of course, they're the targets that you will create when you take one of the Faust architecture files, uh, modify it for the target you want to compile your audio for, and, and submit it back to the community. Um, maybe I should back up a moment and say you know, why... Maybe it's not obvious to everyone why this is so useful, but it's just... Seems like people always write external objects for the, the environment they're programming audio in, but then later someday you want to have your external object running in another audio program. So then you have to go move your audio code into another place, but which takes a lot of time. So it, it's better to write a Faust DSP file, and then you can compile it into all these future targets using a wide array of uh, programming languages. Just to mention that there is a new target for Bella, and uh, and uh, tomorrow I guess people from Bella will be there to demonstrate it. Very cool, very cool. Um, yeah, so you can run you can run this on Bella tomorrow if you want. Um, so what the physical modeling software I will show you does is it lets you specify a physical model in an MDL file. And then you can compile it with the Syntha Modeler compiler into a DSP file, and then go from there wherever you want. I call it Syntha Modeler because it's your it's it's like um, instead of synthesizing sound, you're synthesizing models in this in this environment, and then you can use them later to synthesize sound. And um, my my own personal goal was I just wanted to have. Oh, thank you, thank you. Cool. If you. Um, Basically, I wanted to be, I found myself for all these different haptic devices, and I didn't show them all because I programmed a lot of other ones. I just would keep re-implementing the same thing over and over again. 
in all sorts of places. And it, it was too much work. So then I said, okay, I want to, for the next 40 years, create uh, everything I need uh, in here. And then every time I want to use it, I just compile it into whatever target I need. And then I can keep reusing them and have a, a resource of things. And so that's my um, my goal. And you can create model files in many different ways. You can do it using a text editor. You can do it using scripts. You can do it using the designer GUI. Peter Fasl will be here tomorrow, I believe. And so you can meet with him and learn more about the GUI he's created for it. Um, it would be it's system identification is an interesting way of creating them, or analytical solutions. Uh, there will be another presentation about um, analytically solving acoustics problems and using that to create models, or even statistical methods, which sounds kind of crazy, but it's kind of fun to randomly generate physical models until you find one that you like. Uh, so I. I encourage that approach also. Uh, I found some percussion models that way that I liked. Um, so so this is the tool chain. So tomorrow, if you come at 10, 10 o'clock to, what is it, the seminar room? I've forgotten where it is. I think it's back. That way. It's that way. So if you come at that time, uh, we can help you install the tool chain on your computer because it does have a few components to it. Um, so this is just zooming in on that. So why uh, why not write the physical models directly in Faust? Um, actually, it's great, and many physical models are. Um, I was just trying to do it on a very abstract level, and so I ended up doing it this way. So if you have uh, five masses that are interconnected by springs, five virtual masses interconnected by virtual springs, uh, this is how you could specify that in SynthoModeler. So you list the masses which all have a mass of 0 0.001 kilograms. I gave them all initial positions and velocities of zero. And then you specify uh, springs in between them. So each spring needs a name, and then you tell it what things it connects. And then you just uh, define the parameters for it here. In fact, if you, in a model file, if you have a line that says Faust code colon, it just creates Faust code that is directly translated into the output. So. Um, a lot of what you see in the model files is just literally Faust code there. And that generates, in this case, this is what the Faust code would look like. So it, it, it creates a feedback block structure that has the masses, it simulates the masses, and it simulates the links, and it figures out how to interconnect them all. And the sort of, what, what, why is this challenging? Was ist der Haken? So if you uh, have the forces for the the, the links, have to get exerted on both, you know, each of the masses they're connected to. And if you forget one of those inside here, then you accidentally created something unreal. And it will probably blow up when you simulate it. Who's ever had a filter blow up before? I'm surprised not more. We should, we should, be, we should be programming more filters. Um, <laughs> anyway, it happens, it happens. <laughs> um, and so the the you have to balance so this L2 shows up here and it also shows up oh where is it uh, here so so you, you have to make sure you don't um, forget any of those oh no sorry here that's the one yeah those are the two that makes sense and that those are right there and then L0 is there L3 is there so if you forget one of those, oops, and then it blows up. So if you use the synthesis modeler, that won't happen. Uh, and also we created, so there's a physical modeling.lib file, which is used by synthesis modeler, but that's pure fast code. And that has the um, primitives that are used inside here. And so in, in deciding how to do this, um, we also wanted to try to enable the creation of more models than, or more different kinds of models than we had before. Basically the, most of the physical modeling, or most of the larger physical modeling movements for simulating structural physics in music uh, happen either uh, at uh, Karma at Stanford University or at IRCOM in Paris or at ACROE in Grenoble. And so there's these three paradigms, mass interaction modeling, modal synthesis, or digital waveguide synthesis, 
And I just wanted to be able to combine them to discover things that are different. So this here, so the space of models that are modal models and digital waveguide models are in here. And so it's interesting to think about, well, what can we get there? Or what if we combine all three here? What what model structures might we find that we haven't found so far in these other projects? Um, so that's one of the other benefits of using Synthomodeler. Uh, what are the elements? These, well, these are actually the most basic elements now. I keep adding elements, but... Um, so the simplest ones are mass-like objects, which are um, a, point, a point mass is, you could think of in, in moving in only one axis is basically an object that has uh, inertia and moves uh, up and down only. And then if you take a point mass and you give it infinite number of kilograms, which it weighs, then uh, it becomes a mass that doesn't move, which in Synthomodeler is called a ground object. Um, and then you have to connect the mass-like objects together, which you can do using link-like objects. So a linear link simulates a spring, and this is like the coils of a spring sort of going into the page. Uh, so already using these objects, you can create a damped harmonic oscillator by connecting a ground through a link to a mass, which is sort of, I guess, maybe the most fundamental physical model. Anyway, it only resonates at one frequency. Um, but in order, it's very hard to play that using a device like this. If there's no nonlinear interaction, it's very hard to play. So it helps to have other links which are nonlinear. So a touch link um, looks like this, and you can imagine that as being sort of a spring that disengages. So if you press into a table, you feel a stiffness, and when you pull back up, it's free again. So that's, I guess, what I consider a touch link to be. So you can. And then if you have a port object that represents a haptic device, then you can use that to connect to a mass and actually play it. So I should demonstrate this model, I think. So now I start Jack. And so here are the Synthomodeler models. Um, you can see the models that are in there right now are those. And I already compiled them, which you can do by typing make jackqt. They go inside the jackqt directory. So you can see the compiled ones inside there. But if I wanted to start that one, then you see this nice application show up here, which is uh, made using qt. And turn this up again. So the, the distortion actually made that sound better because it had some overtones. Uh, but just a mass and one link doesn't sound that musical. But the nice thing about physical models is then you have all these parameters you can adjust. So we could increase the damping. which changes the sound a lot. And it changes maybe the way it feels also, if you change the mass. So if you make the mass lower, then it sounds like that. And it's kind of interesting when you're touching the, oh, that's so low we can't hear it. Wait, let me, there, okay. You hear the pitch goes up when I touch it. That's because of the additional stiffness inside the touch link that inside, um, so when, this touch link is also touching the mass, then it has two stiffnesses acting on it, which is this stiffness and that one. So that causes the resonance frequency to go up again, which is kind of interesting. Um, so that's a really elementary model. But if you start adding more, more uh, objects, then you can get more models. So I was showing you a drum before, so maybe I should finish the drum. What's wrong with this drum? What happens if you hit this drum? Maybe it's not a problem, depending on your point of view, but yes. That's right. 
I, yeah, I didn't include gravity in Synthon Modeler. So if you hit this, it will just fly away forever, um, which makes it harder to play. Although if you make it bounce, if you made it bounce back and forth off of the moon or something, well, it'd have to be moving pretty fast to hear it, I guess. But anyway, that would be interesting. Um, but yeah, yeah, you want to have some links connecting it to ground around the edges to keep it from flying away, usually. Um, and so that gives you a sound that's very linear if, if you're plucking it. So, so how do you hit that? Uh, you have to have a port. Uh, and in this case, uh, here I'm using a technique uh, suggested by Claude Cardoz to connect a, sp a spring to a mass and then use that to hit the membrane so that you, it changes the timbre uh, if you do it that way. Um, but still, the sound of this is going to be linear when you're not touching it. So it's kind of interesting to add some snares. So I added some, if you take another mass and you put a touch link between it and that one, and do the same thing here and the same thing here, then you get like little balls sort of bouncing on top of this membrane. And then I I did this trick, also recommended by Claude Cardoz, using springs to simulate gravity, kind of. and. Um, so that way you can keep the snare sort of landing right on top of it. So I, I made this model. Uh, where is it? So actually I made four of them. Let's try this one. So, oh, I didn't know you could do that. Cool. Uh, so it doesn't sound that much like uh, it doesn't sound that much like a drum that you're familiar with because the parameters aren't tuned that way. kind of hear the snares bouncing off of it. But because I put four of them, you can play two of them on each fader. So that was just changing the parameters. Uh, that's something that people learned in, in nonlinear science, that if you sometimes if you change a parameter a little bit, the dynamics can suddenly change a lot. And that's um, that sort of thwacking sound that, you, that we have there. Uh, this one is just a slower one. So it's, it's kind of interesting to... So with, with physical modeling, you can find timbres that are reminiscent of ones you've heard before, but that are different. And just by, by tuning the physical model uh, values, you can change them. I guess, what is this one? I could change the masses, I guess. Um, and oh, so here I labeled the items. And then I added one more thing here to try to make the dynamics a little bit more interesting if you want to play drum rolls um, using your fingers. Um, which is, I'm not going to really go into that because that's based on another project that's kind of unrelated to the presentation. But um, basically, if you use uh, a pulse touch link instead of a normal touch link, then it'll enable you to play drum rolls with just one finger, which is kind of interesting. I think later today you'll see a video demo of that in a different context on a slightly different device that makes more sense. I just thought I would mention it now because I had this slide open. Um, are there questions about this drum model? Yes. How expensive is it? That's a good question. I, I made this model 
with so few masses because I wanted it to be cheap. And I don't recall, I think you could probably, if I just guessed, I would say you could run 40 of them on a standard laptop at the same time. I mean, certainly more than 10 or 20, I think. Mm. Maybe even more than 40. It, actually, what makes a big difference is zipper noise. With the physical models, you may have noticed when I was adjusting that mass parameter, it didn't have any glitches in the zipper noise. But if you, as soon as you put a smooth, colon smooth, <coughs> after the H slider in the code for specifying the slider, then uh, it's calculating the, uh, it's recalculating the physical param modeling parameters more frequently, and so it uses more CPU. Maybe not so much in this model, but in some of the other models, it is possible. You have to be careful not to, you have to accept zipper noise sometimes if you want it to be cheap. Um, something I found. Um, but yeah, if you want it to sound more like a normal drum, use more masses. Use more masses and more snares, I guess. I only had three. <laughs> but it sounded pretty dense already, just with three, three snares. Um, and so adding another uh, model to make it possible to do modal synthesis within SynthModeler is called the resonators object here. Um, and Pascal Kopp has now arrived, and he has worked some with this, this object in finding ways to specify this. But uh, that's nice because with physical modeling, sometimes it's, it's uh, a good exercise to be adjusting all the physics parameters. Or sometimes you're in a hurry and you just want, you want to know what frequencies something is going to oscillate at. Then you can use the resonators object to do it. Um, and so, and there's also another link-like object called a pluck link, which is kind of like a plectrum. So I'll show a model where you're uh, plucking a, a modal synthesis object called resonators. Um, let's see. So this model is just analytically calculating the resonant frequencies for a rectangular membrane. And if you set the cutoff frequency, you know, you can, you, there are various things you can change. You can change its length also. Which is kind of interesting. So that's convenient if instead you wanted to uh, do it a different way. If you wanted to actually specify all the frequencies for the modal synthesis object, you could instead do this. Um, oh, it must be touch. Several. Right. So we could do this model. Uh oh. I'll look at that later. Anyway, there's another model where you can set the frequencies directly. Uh, so I wrote a, So I decided to write a piece for 62 loudspeakers using physical modeling uh, because this was the number we had available at our laboratory at that time. And I wanted to have a different sound signal coming out of each loudspeaker. So and I was, I was inspired by 
um, some other prior works by Steve Reich involving swinging microphones over feedback loudspeakers or um, uh, Ligeti's piece with 100 metronomes. Uh, so in this case, the balls or the masses bouncing on top of the resonators are kind of like metronomes. And then each of the modal synthesis resonators is tuned to a different note. Uh, each one has four resonant frequencies. And then there are two, and they're so small you can't really see them, but there's one, here's one port of a haptic device, and here's the other port on one. And so what one of these does is it raises all of the, all of these balls, so you can get them all bouncing at the same time. The other one uh, picks them up sort of gradually, sort of, uh, it's starting with, with these, and then as you push the, it further up, it lifts up all the other ones. And so that's, that's kind of an interesting, a uh, piece to listen to, so I'll show that. So that's how that, that one ends. And that was made with these uh, just masses bouncing on top of those resonators. So actually, there are a lot of other interesting things you could do with this model. I just, that was what I did with this one. Um, I like the fact that it sounded so much not like a bunch of masses bouncing on resonators. But there's another part in the piece where they're all bouncing in phase, and they slowly go out of phase. And it's nice to listen to on 62 loudspeakers. Um, I guess if, if if there's an eight-channel system tonight, I might play it over eight channels. Um, would be nice. But um, with 62 loudspeakers, it makes a, a highly immersive sound, and it's it's again it's a it's an instrument that is sort of a fundamentally new interaction in terms of how you sort of pick up all of these masses that are bouncing. It would be really hard to pick up 62 different balls bouncing on top of resonators using a physical object in the real world, but you could do it. Um, but anyway, it's a lot easier with electronics. And it has this nice way of algorithmically generating music if you're just dropping a few of them also. Um, other elements in Synthemodel are, are the waveguide elements, which model strings. Um, so you can make a pluck string in Synthemodel, for example, by having two terminations with the waveguide spanning in between them and a junction that connects it to uh, something that can, can excite it. So that's a plucked string model. Or you can make a waveguide drum like this. I've never seen anyone make a drum by connecting a bunch of strings together, but actually you could do it. Um, it, it might be hard though. But anyway, and it would feel kind of weird to be plucking something like this, but you can make it in Synthemodelers. So let me demonstrate those models. Um, maybe I'll just go ahead and demonstrate the harp, which is 20 of those, of the string model. Um, so that's, that's a harp. It has a lot of parameters you can adjust, like each of its frequencies individually. That's just the way they're initialized. But um, let's see. You can make it 
sound a less bright or more bright. Uh, of course, the damping is a nice thing to change. You can change how much damping there is in the plectrum. change the width of the plectrum, you can change its stiffness. The wave impedance of the strings is kind of interesting to adjust. You can also make them all longer or shorter or detune them. Uh, you can imagine, I think, what that, that sounds like. I'll show the waveguide drum. just four strings. So it's kind of interesting to adjust the delays of the different strings. But if you're, if you're careful how you adjust them, it sounds kind of like a drum. Let's see. Basically, it's kind of like tuning four uh, delay lines in a reverb. Who's ever made a reverb using four delay lines? Or maybe more. Maybe it sounds better with more. But it's the same problem if you just have four. You want to tune them to relatively prime lengths to have a, more, a sound with more different resonant frequencies inside it. Although beating is kind of interesting with this drum if you get it beating, um, which you can do. But I think... I don't recall what a reverb sounds like if it's beating. Uh, that's probably a strange kind of sound. Uh, anyway, so that's uh, that's the drum. So we're collecting a library of models uh, for various uses. So come come try them out, see what you think. Um, let's see. Were there questions about physical modeling? Yes. Uh, yeah, there were some clicks. Was was that because of the the dezippering, de less of the, uh, lack of dezippering? I think the zi I think in one case there was some zipper noise in that piece. I didn't adjust those parameters in real time, so I didn't have a smoothing right. uh, function on them. But it, it would have been nicer with that. I also think there's somewhere up here there's some noise getting in uh, sometimes, um, which was part of it. But yeah, I think it was mainly the zipper noise. Um, we, there are some new elements now like stiffening springs and softening springs and things like that that make for some pretty interesting sounds. Um, yes. I have a question. Yes. Uh, since now you can combine all this mod uh, model, mm -hmm. what do you think? Is there, are you always using one model more than the others? or? Do you have a favorite approach? Or? That's can you almost a political question. <laughs> <laughs> I love them all. They're all great. And I love them even more <laughs> together. Um, let's see. Um, so here, if you could build a string with springs that get softer when they get extended, which uh, there are actually some opera gongs like this that have sort of a softening spring sort of characteristic, then the pitch would go down as you would hit it harder. So that, that model is kind of interesting. I, sh I suppose I should show the stiffening variant of that. Um, so Steve Beck used this to write a piece for Laptop Orchestra called Quartet for Strings. Um, let's see. So this is the lowest one of those strings. There's also, you'll find in the library, also a viola and a violin. But, um, and again, it depends a lot how you have the parameters set, but let's see. So it's a stiffening string. The harder you hit it, the more the pitch goes up. 
actually if you take out all the damping it takes a very long time for the the energy to decay and the pitch to go down um, yeah that scratching sound is coming from the PA it's not in the models but anyway that that's pr a pretty interesting model um, I'll show a model that combines all three at the same time. Uh, I need to remember the name, though. Um, just ratchet string resonator. Okay, let's try this one. I think maybe I showed this one at the beginning. This is a mass plucking a mass that bounces back and forth between the resonator's object and the waveguide string. And actually, we could look at the... Uh, we went to the GUI. No, that's the post window, isn't it? have to forgive me, I don't use my Linux computer that much. But before coming here, I wanted to make sure everything worked on Linux. <laughs> because the, the POSIX the serial drivers should be the same for Mac and Linux. However, <laughs> uh, I had some discoveries in that area. Um, I think maybe I had it in here. Uh, but if we, if we look inside here, Um, we could take a look at the ratchet model. Here it is. So the model didn't say where the objects were, so it had to figure out where to put them. So here's the string with a junction connected by a touch link to this mass that's bouncing between the string and the resonator's object up here. And here's the device that's used to, to pluck it. And I'm going to stop it from doing that because it's confusing. But anyway. That's the model you're hearing there. And um, anyway, that, 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 that should give you a good idea of a lot of the stuff that's in there. So um, thanks a lot for having me. Uh, new technology and new music are sort of intertwined this way. And so we're working on writing new music and then seeing what ideas that gives us for new technology and then iterating like that. Um, what will you make with these technologies? I, I hope, I, I don't even know, but I have lots of ideas and I'm sure you do too. Um, and I wanted to um, thank the organizers for having me here and my master's students, Pascal Kapp, Denis Huber and Peter Vasel for their help with the project. And um, I also just wanted to thank you all for helping make Linux audio a possibility. Uh, because it's, and I'm very happy to be here among you all, uh, where there's such strong support for uh, open source software. So uh, thank you. Thank you. One more question, please. <laughs> I was wondering whether the special effect guys shouldn't be interested in, in these physical models. Have you thought about that? Have you, are you in touch with them? Which, which special effects well, guys? Well, the guys working on Star Wars movies or something like that. They, uh, they do stuff in non-real-time, in, in non usually, which is a very different way of simulation than real-time simulation. And um, actually, it's an interesting question. Uh, when you, I, I encourage you all, when you meet people from the graphics community, to convince them they should learn more about audio, because I find a lot of the graphics people think they know about audio, right. and I find often they don't, in, in my opinion, or at least not about real-time real -time audio, and they, they think that it's all a very arbitrary thing that we just 
get together and put a bunch of weird code and but there there's method and reason behind every step that I know of taking anyway and I, I think sometimes that's underappreciated I apologize if that wasn't your question yeah, sure. <laughs> but but uh, Have you tried to some of your models on uh, smartphones? Uh, we haven't published that yet. Uh -huh. But uh, yes, we have. Actually, Pascal Kapp has... I don't know if you were going to say something about this. But do you have these modern models for iPhone? But they're not written in assembly code and then tried. Mm. Uh, but just to test how many signs we can generate on the iPhone. <laughs> it was just, just in real time. Just test But I have a good idea, I think, because I compile them for Raspberry Pi all the time. All these models run on Raspberry Pi too. Mm. Um, I, I think every one of them runs on Raspberry. The Raspberry Pi one is not nearly as powerful as the Raspberry Pi two for DSP, for some complicated reason. Maybe having to do with the the GNU compiler. Um, um, but if you come to NIME, you can see, what, or I'll tell you later, what what we are doing. Yes, um, great. Um, I've I've forgotten what's next on the program. Oh, perfect. You're so prepared. Okay, open AV on. And in the seminar room also. So in five minutes.